So, here we are at CrewWorks, fitting a DCC chip to a non-DCC ready locomotive. This is a heavily modified CrewWorks, as you can see. We've got just the equipment we need to carry out this surgical procedure. <laughs> I'll give you a quick run through it now. Okay, well standing right back from the table, two things that's impossible to miss are these two huge, really powerful lamps. They're not halogen or anything, they're just normal incandescent bulbs, but they are incredibly powerful and they give us um, all the light we need to carry out any work um, on any locomotive, basically. So working our way from the right to the left, the first thing we've got are these Xeron track cutters. They're incredibly powerful track cutters, but you can use them for cutting anything. You can use them for cutting um, bits out of plastic airfix kits and you can use them for cutting wire um, they'll cut through plastic and metal with ease next up is just a pair of scissors and then we've got the Grabatron oh some pretty funky um, magnification of the the mat going on there <laughs> um, you can get these from most um, craft centers and stuff and basically what's so good about this is that you've got a magnifying glass to give you a really, really good close-up image of something. And then you've got these two little crocodile clips. They'll hold anything you want to hold while you work on it. You see? It's just a really, really useful tool. And so we might need to use that. Then of course we've got the actual chip. This is a very basic DCC chip. They're about 10, 11, 12 quid. Um, it's the Hornby Oh, bad zoom. The R8249. And it's a cracking little chip, to be honest. There's no need to go for anything too fancy. Next up, we've got this excellent tool called a gap opener, which is plastic, not metal. So it's not going to scratch or harm um, locomotive cases and bodies as we open them. But that's proved to be invaluable sometimes. Next up we've got a craft knife, in its protective um, sheath of course. Then moving to the back we've got the Hornby Rolling Road. And contrary to popular belief, it's happy to be DC or DCC, as you'll see later. At the moment it's plugged into a basic Hornby Select DCC controller there, which isn't switched on because we don't need it just yet, but we will be using that at the end to give the locomotive chip its new number. Okay, and panning round, we come to the soldering iron. It is essential that you have one of these. Basically it's going to make fitting a DCC chip to a non-DCC ready locomotive very hard if you haven't got one. And just there we've got the solder all, all coiled up inside there. So we'll be using that later. And then moving over to the far left We've got basically a packet of different wires. They're all really quite fine and they're colour coded to help you with your work, whatever your project is basically. So for example you can use a particular colour to go to the lights, a particular colour to go to the motor and so on. And then the reason um, we've got some more black cable here is obviously we've used quite a bit of the black cable already. And then this piece of what looks like black wire it's actually heat shrink tubing and what you do with this is you basically cut a section of it off you insert it onto the end of a piece of wire you then solder that piece of wire to another piece of wire make the connection and then you move this piece of heat shrink tubing across and over the join and then you heat it up now you can heat it up with the um, hot part of the soldering iron or you can heat it up with a hairdryer or however you want but as you heat it up it shrinks and as it shrinks it contracts around the join holding it firmly in place and protecting it giving it insulation and then at the very far left of our setup we've got these little sticky pads and basically these are our DCC jackets we don't use DCC jackets to insulate the tip from the rest of the locomotive we use these what they do is they basically kill two birds with one stone. They fit the chip 
to a particular part of the chassis or you know to the underside of a locomotive and because of because they're foam because they're foam pads they insulate the chip as well they they make sure that the chip doesn't make connection with anything that's metal obviously plastic's not really a problem seeing as plastic doesn't conduct electricity okay so going back over to the center um, this rather useful tool here is by Pico and this is a servicing cradle and it's made out of foam and what this allows us to do is to turn the locomotive upside down and insert it just like that holding it nice and steady without damaging or scratching it while we carry out work on her. This is a craft mat to stop us from slicing up the dining table or the lovely cover that we've put over it temporarily. And then there's a pair of precision screwdrivers, a Phillips crosshead and a flat one as well. And that's it. That's basically all the equipment you need to DCC a non-DCC ready locomotive. And what locomotive is it we're chipping? Let's just have a look at it. Well, I'll just rest her on the top like that. She's the Isle of Iona. She's a Class 47 by Hornby. She's nothing particularly special. She came in the Serco rail test set actually. Um, but she's a non DCC ready locomotive and so we're going to chip her. Okay, we're almost ready to start. Two essentials we almost forgot, and crucially we need them, <laughs> are um, a mug of tea and some Jaffa cakes. So, with some fuel for Craig and me holding the camera, take it away. Okay, so the first thing we need to do is obviously get the body off uh, so we can have a look inside and see how she's wired up at the moment as a DC loco. Um, so if we turn her over and have a look we can see straight away there's no screws actually holding this one together um, but there are these little plastic hooks or plastic sort of nodules that are holding it in place yes I so, see so we obviously need to prise the body apart to actually pull this one off so this is where the little gap opener will come in because I can slide it in the edge and then use my nail on the other side to be able to pull the body away from there Ooh. Ooh. That's it. Bit of a tough one. She's putting up a bit of a fight, is she? A little bit, yeah. But you've just got to be firm and gentle at the same time, <laughs> if that makes sense. There we go. Okay, so with all six clips now prized apart, we can just pull away the body and the cab detail as well and reveal what's inside. So we've got a weight in the middle to give her plenty of traction. Then we can see that obviously at one end we've got the motor bogey and at the other end just the normal dummy bogey. But there are wires going to both ends because she actually has pickups on both bogies to try and make sure that she doesn't cut out yeah. on things like points. Mm -hmm. Now this particular one being a more sort of recent model um, is actually quite nicely laid out. You can see that they've used different colour wire to give us a pretty good indication of which is positive and which is negative. Yep. And you can see that actually there's a whole collection of wires coming from the motor bogey as well, so that everything is nice and um, isolated and, and easy to trace. Okay, so obviously as a DC locomotive, if we just pop her on the track, The electricity comes down the two rails, so we've got the one side and uh, one side being positive and one side being negative. And the locomotive itself then completes the circuit, so the power travels from the wheels on one side through the collection, um, 
the, through the pickup, sorry, um, up through the wire to the motor and then passes through the motor, makes everything turn and then travels back down the black wires to the other side of the track to complete the circuit. Yep. If we want to DCC the locomotive, what we have to do is basically interrupt that power supply so that rather than the power going straight to and from the motor, we can actually have it going to the chip, which is over there, and then going from the chip into the motor unit itself. Okay, so if we have a close look at the motor, we can see that she's a ring field motor. Um, this isn't uncommon for this kind of diesel locomotive. Quite a lot of them use this arrangement. But what is a little bit different with this being a slightly more recent um, motor from Hornby is that one half here at the back, you can just about see the split there, that back half normally on an older motor is actually part of the conducting circuit. So that part of the, mo that part of the motor housing is actually part of the circuit itself and the metal carries the electricity. And then you can see the two screws at the front one of those screws is normally much longer and actually passes right through into the metal back uh, back piece. Yes, I've seen that. Um, so that it actually completes the electric circuit and the, the electricity passes through the screw. But this one's not like that. This one doesn't seem to be like that because you can see that all the wires actually all come centrally back to this capacitor in the middle and then split off to the two contacts either side. And it's probably important to point out at this point that Almost every locomotive you open up is different. Yes. Um, so this you just have to use this video as a guide, really. Yeah. This is the first one um, that I've ever done that's kind of got this arrangement with all these wires. Um, so I think if we do another video at some point in the near future, we'll actually have a look at one that's the sort of older style. One that um, uses the chassis. That uses the chassis as a conductor. Yeah. Because they are a little more complicated to deal with because you have to isolate mm. the actual uh, contact between the screw Using and the metal plastic plate. and stuff. Yes. So we'll come to that another time, I think. Okay. Well, let's start simple. So um, we've got our wires coming up, going through this capacitor in the middle. And so all I want to do right now is just cut the wires coming out at the base of the capacitor that go off to the two sides there. Um, you could, if you wanted to, desolder the two contacts and actually pull the whole thing out, um, but that's a, probably a little excessive what we want to do if we just get our wire cutters and snip. And then on the other side, do the same. Faster comes free. And if we just loosen these loops of the wire, we can start to free the whole mechanism up. So as we can see, as expected, all the black wires are coming over and going to one side, and all of the red wires are coming over and going to the other side. Mm -hmm. So again, what we need to do now is just cut all of those wires so that they're all separate and isolated and we can uh, free up the bare wire inside to actually solder them to their new contact. Okay. So, take the wire cutters again. Just cut there. And cut there. We don't need the capacitor anymore um, because that was also part of the system that was designed to reduce interference with things like TVs. Um, so the DCC chip replaces that function and we don't need it anymore so we can just throw that away. Okay, so we've got all of our black wires for one side of the track and you can see that all the black wires actually come from contacts on the same side of the locomotive and all the red ones come from contacts on the other side. Yep. Okay, if we now have a little look at the chip, no, just to get inside. Now, obviously, this packet is an anti-static packet to try and uh, make sure that no static electricity discharges can cause damage to the chip. As a small electronic component, it is prone to static discharge and you could cause damage if you don't look after it. However, you don't really need to be quite as cautious as some people might make out. Um, 
They're pretty robust they're, things. They're fairly robust things. Um, just try and be careful that you've not spent the last half hour rubbing around with your feet and, <laughs> uh, and whatever on the carpet before you start touching it. So if we have a look at the chip and I just roll it out, at one end we've got the actual chip itself that does all the fancy bits. So that's the decoder. Yeah. And at the other end we've got the 8-pin uh, harness. If I just pull a little foam insert out, you can see it a little bit more clearly. So there's the 8 pins that would normally fit into a DCC-ready socket. Yep. We've also got this stray purple wire. Yes. Which isn't connected to anything. No. And often confuses people. A little, yes. Um, the decoder itself is a four-function decoder. Yes. So you could um, have lights, um, maybe configured so you've got different lights in different directions. You could possibly even have some kind of um, sound system, maybe, although you wouldn't really use this kind of chip with that. But lots of different functions that you can control with your DCC decoder, uh, with your DCC controller. By default, the 8-pin system is only built for three functions. So the spare purple wire is so that you can actually wire up a fourth function device yeah. that isn't part of the DCC-ready system. So if you've got a DCC-ready loco, you can still just pop the chip in. But if you want to wire up something separate, like your own additional interior cab lighting or something, yeah. you can use that purple uh, wire to do that separately. Okay, but that'll be another video. That'll be another video. Yeah. Now, because this is a um, because this is a loco that um, doesn't have any lights or anything like that at the moment and is unlikely to require all four functions and to make our life a little bit easier later on I'm actually going to trim that purple wire gonna cut it right off yeah because we're unlikely to use it and I've left myself enough wire there that if I really wanted to I could sort of strip it and solder it to something um, but otherwise it just gets it out of the way and makes yeah. it a little less hassle Yeah. and also because she isn't a DCC ready locomotive I'm going to take more drastic measures and cut off the actual harness. Wow, you've chopped his head off. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, so now the most important and useful thing will be to know what each of those wires actually does. Yes. Otherwise it'll be a bit confusing. Please do let us know. So, if we open up the instructions... Go to the inside page there in the English section so I can actually understand it. I need to have a look at this section down here. Okay. Okay. So this is the connection specification, and as you can see, it says um, the NMRA plug in number um, because this is an NMRA, this is an NMRA um, compatible decoder and obviously the entire pin system is standardized to mean that you can put any decoder into any locomotive um, and it will still work. Yes. But then here it says the wiring color so you can see the orange, yellow, green, black, gray, white, blue, red and purple. Mm -hmm. If I bring back the chip you can see we've got all of those colors in those wires there. We have, yep. So if we have a look across we can see what they all do in a slightly odd order, but orange is the motor right, and if we actually skip down a little bit, right towards the bottom where it says red, red is the right rail. Right. Okay. And then if we go back in other random order, so we've got black is the left rail, and grey is motor left. Right, so grey needs to connect to black. Yep. And red needs to connect to orange. Okay. So whereas at the moment, if we just go back over to the locomotive, at the moment, the black goes directly into the motor and the red goes directly into the motor, what these instructions tell us now is that the black needs to go to the chip on its black wire, Yeah. and then the grey wire that comes back out mm -hmm. needs to connect up to where the black wire used to go yeah. on the motor, and the uh, red wires need to connect up to the red wire on the decoder, and then the matching orange one that comes out needs to go off to where the red was before. Okay. Okay. Okay, so we know the way that the loco is laid out inside. We know the way in which the 
uh, chip needs to be connected up and so what we need to do now is actually think about how we're going to fit everything inside and make sure that everything um, works nicely. So if we then have a look at the inside of the locomotive again we need to find a space where the chip can go. That's not going to clash with the inside of the actual body. Mm. If we have a look at the inside of the body you can see that obviously as a diesel locomotive um, it's a little bit easier because you've just got a big empty sort of square space. Yeah. So it's a bit easier to find something to uh, some place to hide them usually in a diesel. Um, and if we sort of look at the inside there, it's actually very nice on this one because the weight sits over to one side of this central section and there's actually a big empty recess there. Yeah. That's so perfect. so there's quite a nice little space there for us to fit the chip in. Okay. The only problem that that means is all the little wires that came over to the motor before hmm. are obviously quite short on this side. Ah, so they're not going to reach. And they're not going to reach. So you're going to have to extend them. So we're going to have to do a little bit of rewiring to get the connection over here. Now we've got a couple of options. We could strip out all these wires completely and using some new replacement wire. Oh yeah. We could just wire up our own set to make them as long as we want to. Okay. But since these are obviously nice and factory fitted and we can see right at the bottom they've already got nice heat shrinking over the bottom and it's all nice and, and tested, I don't necessarily want to start hacking away at the bottom if I don't have to. So what I'm actually going to do with this one is join these two wires, the short ones. Yeah. Join those two short ones to this long one that goes over to the other bogey and actually solder them together at that end there. Okay. And then I can cut this long wire again somewhere nearer my central gap in the middle. Near the chip. And then I can put the chip in that little gap that I cut there. Okay. Okay. So, first of all, I need to strip the little plastic sheath off the end of all of these wires. Right. So, if I sort of straighten it out a little bit and put it down to the cutting mat. I personally find using a knife for this is easy enough. Um, because I can carefully control it and oh. just slice a little bit. But some people obviously prefer to use cutters, some people might actually have a wire stripper, it depends on what you find easiest to use. But if I just take the knife and then make a slight press on one side, turn it around a little bit and make another little press, and just push away. Wow. <laughs> Okay. Just strip away a little bit of the plastic and then pull it down the other side. And I can just use my cutters then to trim that little bit off. I'll just cut all the rest of them off. I won't make you watch me do all of them. Okay. And then we'll come back and have a look what ne uh, the next step is. Okay, so I've now stripped off all of the ends of the wires and given them a little twist to actually twist the little copper strands together and make it a little bit more secure. The next step now is we need to do what's called tinning the ends of the wires, um, which is basically using a little bit of solder to, um, to coat the ends and, and make them into a solid piece that makes them easier to deal with. Wow. As you can see, just in that, possibly, can you see that on the tip mm -hmm. of the wire? So I've just run a little bit of silver solder along there, so that one looks silvery ends where the others are still bare copper. But that just helps making the connection a little bit easier. Now, I'm not going to teach you all how to solder in this video, because otherwise it'll just take a lot longer. Um, but if you're not sure how to actually use a soldering iron and how to make these kind of uh, simple jobs, um, then you need to search around on YouTube and find some tutorials on how to do that. Okay, so we've now tinned the end of all of the wires and you can see that I've actually twisted together the two wires on this side and the two wires on that side and we now need to connect them up with the 
or the two wires that are left loose. Yeah. But when we've soldered them together, obviously there's then the risk that as the wires slip maybe through movement or something, that they end up touching and short-circuiting and that would be quite bad. Yes. So we need to make sure they're nice and insulated. And so that's where our heat shrink tubing comes in. And then most importantly, and the bit that I often forget, is make sure that you then slide the heat shrink tubing onto one side before you actually solder them together. Okay, so by tidying up the connections and sliding the heat sleeve over the top, the final thing to do is then take the soldering iron again, but not with the actual tip, just with sort of the shaft. Very gently, just rub it along the heat shrink. And you, should, you might be able to see that it's actually shrinking around the connection. Yes. Only slightly. Yes, we can see it. Just. But just enough to make it a permanent, tight connection. Yeah. That's completely insulated. We now need to actually connect in our chip over at this end here. Like that. Okay, so in the time while we've been gone, um, all these wires have now been tinned and connected together. And what you can see is I've also done the same for the end of the chip. Wrapped everything together here in a little joint. And I just need to finish off soldering this last one in place. Okay, what you'll also notice is, because the chip is going to fit into this little gap here, the orange and the grey wires, that if you remember, are the ones that um, the instructions pointed out were for the motor left and motor right, yeah. need to come back over here to the original motor connections. So I've also used a little bit of my extra wire and another connection there to actually just extend the orange wire from the decoder and the grey wire from the decoder so that I can actually come back over here to the motor. Using the same colour cabling. Yes, makes it nice and easy to know what's going on. Yeah. Okay, so back over here at the motor. If you remember when we first took it apart and the capacitor was here, it was. All the black connections were coming over to this side, and all the red connections were coming over to this side. Mm -hmm. And so, again, back in the instructions, where the black wire is left rail, then the grey is motor left. So if the black used to go to this side, the grey now needs to go to that side. And on the opposite side, the orange goes where the red was before. Okay. So all I need to do now is solder those two connections in place. Wow. So it now looks a little bit more complicated than it did before. <laughs> Got a few more wires to deal with. But the most important thing is that if we just move both bogies, they've still got enough flexibility to be able to go around those bends without all these wires tugging and pulling them in the wrong direction. You could, if you wanted to, actually use one of the sticky pads and stick it in place and fix it. Yeah, go fix for it. it down. Go for it. Touch it down to the bottom and fix it in place. So our chip is now at the bottom. Yep. And all the spare space on that side just gives us a nice space to tuck in our wires. So we've got a nice neat job as well. Excellent. Okay. Time to test. Gosh. Yeah, it cuts out there. So that's about as slow as it will go. But if you actually look at the wheels, I don't know if you can quite see the speed of the wheel turning. See, once it's gone through all the gearing. Oh my gosh, there's practically nothing there. <laughs> mm. And then we have class 47, the Isle of Iona, DCC chipped.
Excellent.